Well, welcome everyone to the fifth episode of Sea Nature, uh, recorded today on Midsummer's Day. We have a usual packed programme ahead of us uh, with many of our usual features. And this week we're joined by our guest, Dr. Tim Cottrell from the University of Falmouth. As always, we start with a little bit of interaction. I'm asking you now to indicate on the slides, on this slide, where you you are. So if you pick up the pencil at the top, and you can choose whichever colour you would like, and you can make a little note, a little mark, as to where you are. I see we've got Almo who is spelling out the word Italy in there. Uh, we have people right the way down in Cornwall, I see. Uh, that's, uh, that's very good. And right the way up to uh, County Durham, which is uh, excellent. And we move on to our quiz of the week. Um, we can see that it's something to do with water but uh, an unusual view of this particular species. I wonder if anybody has any idea as to what this might be. If you'd like to add something in the comments, if you have. Hannah's thinking that it might be a tufted duck. Fiona that it could be a pintail duck. Steve Garland thinks it's a tufted duck. So it's two to one out of a total of three in favour of tufted duck at the moment, which you'll see later on. And now we turn to our lockdown sightings. What is it that's made us go wow this particular week? And for me, it was going out for a walk at the weekend and uh, passing by a hedgerow where I saw, believe it's not, my first comma butterfly of the year. I know that's rather late, but it was the first one that I'd seen. A little later, uh, walking through a, an area of um, some woodland and through a glade in that woodland, um, a red admiral came and rested on me. And in the clearing in that bit of woodland, uh, there were many um, meadow browns flitting around. So my uh, sightings, uh, my the thing that made me go wow was to see all these butterflies. And what about you? If anybody would like to open their microphone or add a comment, what is it that's made you go wow this week? Um, Fiona, do you want to say something? Yes, yes. Um, well, um, we had great fun on Solstice night getting out the moth trap for the first time. Um, and it was probably the best haul I've ever experienced. So um, I, I don't have a photo I can share officially online, but um, we had this, I don't know if you can see that, we had three tiger hawk moths, not one, but three. If I, if I come off that and then you, you might be able to see it. Um, and then we also had, as if that wasn't enough, we had a privet hawk moth, which was even better, even bigger. Um, not as pretty as the tiger hawk, but still um, very lovely. And the privet hawk moth, there's a, there's a reasonable picture of it. No? It's not um, on the screen yet, so it is. Yep. Yep. Um, what was lovely is I, it was a bit ragged. I think it was probably perhaps nearing the end of its cycle. <coughs> me on that but it actually hung around all day i left the large pot open it was free to roam but it hung around all the, all the following day for regular inspection so that was something very special indeed it is thank you for sharing that fiona is there anybody else that has anything that they'd like to share with you steve Allen, I can see has physically raised his hand in front of me on the screen if you'd like to open your microphone and share with your hopefully is it working it is working. Excellent. Uh, yeah, well, I went for a cycle this morning down to Morecambe Seafront and amazingly, there was a cormorant in the water and I watched it catch an enormous eel and then spend about 10 minutes working out how to swallow it, which eventually it did. 
I suspect <laughs> it didn't keep the rest of the day. You don't see eels very often around here, but uh, that, so it, it, it was quite an ex a special experience, that one. And that was in the sea? That was in the sea, just off the stone jetty in Orkham, yeah. Right, excellent. Good. Anybody else got anything that they'd like to share with us that they've seen? I... Uh, Greg? Oop. I nearly stepped on a female adder up on Cleve Hill uh, yesterday, uh, which was a bit of a shock. Um, I was just walking down sort of a stone gully, saw this shape quite close to my right foot and realised it was a female adder sort of slithering away into the uh, grass, which is my second sighting up there of an adder um, ever. So that was quite a shock. <laughs> Good. Anybody else got anything they'd like to share? I've, uh, I've got something. Well, it's not quite as interesting as an adder, but I also almost stepped on something quite small, which was a, a wood mouse that has been living in my garden. But we uh, just found out it's been living in like the the wild flower area, and it came out to the um, to where we have all the bird feed, uh, all the seed and all that. And uh, as I was walking by, I almost um, stood on it and flattened it, flattened its no, uh, until it was you know nothing <laughs> left of it, but. We managed to manage to scurry away and grab some food on its way as well. So it was, it was cute. Excellent. Thank you for sharing that. Anybody else got anything that they would like to add? Is that Fiona again? No, though, if we have no more that people would like to, uh, to add, then we will move on. Tim. Oh, Tim, have you got something? What would you like to add, Tim? Yes, hello. If, I, if I'm allowed to talk at this bit, that's uh, that's great. Well, I, I, I found something um, that I've never seen before, actually. So a, a, a really interesting uh, insect that's that I'd wanted to see for years. And I've got some. If, can people see my video here? I've got the um, the evidence of it over here. So this is a tiny leaf roll, and it's rolled up by a beetle called a hazel leaf roller. Um, and it was uh, the, the female deposits a single egg inside this little uh, packet that she rolls up, uses a tight leg to make this amazing, very, very tidy little package. And then the larva lives inside that. So I've got them uh, on the bush just outside the window. So it's an exciting thing. The first time I've ever seen one. And I think you're down in Cornwall. Is that right, Tim? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. As almost as far as you can get. Yeah. Not far from the very tip of the country. And is that a species that is associated with the southwest or would we expect to get it up here in the north? Yeah, it ranges mainly down in, in around the southern parts of England. Yes, yeah, so and not particularly southwest, but in the in the south of England. And it's it's probably one of the reasons why I'd never seen it before, because I'm from Yorkshire originally. Um, but I mean, they they are across the UK, but more common in the in the south. I can see that Steve is trying to get my attention. Steve. Yeah, I was just going to say we get them around Morecambe Bay and the limestone around there, but then we get lots of stuff around Morecambe Bay limestone that we shouldn't get this far north. Mm -hmm. Good. Anything from anybody else? In that case, we'll move on to our webcam of the week. Uh, when you go to this site, you'll see that there are uh, a few webcams to choose from. And the one that I would like you to choose is the one that says looking over Meadow Lake. Having bathed at least uh, virtually in nature for a minute, I wonder if anybody's got any comments that they'd like to make on that webcam. Again, in the it was, it was really good. Thank you.
I don't know if Steve wants to say anything. Or, um, watch the other leg by mistake. <laughs> well done, Steve. Steve is actually the uh, the chair of the Wildlife Trust uh, that owns Rock Hills. So um, uh, you probably know the site and you probably know the um, uh, the webcams very well. But, but you enjoyed your time in nature, I hope, Steve. Are you saying yes? <laughs> Uh, Fiona's asking how far it is from the sea. Steve, can you help me with this? How far is it from Brockholes to the sea? I would. It's just above Preston, so the, the river is actually tidal to, as far as Brockholes. Uh, but I would say, oh dear, it's only about something like five miles, it's not far. Yeah, okay, mm -hmm. makes sense. And the, um, the, the lagoons there are not tidal. Uh, the, the river runs around the outside of the, the reserve. And we move on to Greg and to uh, a matter of moth. Thanks, Philip. Um, this week's been quite interesting with the uh, weather. Um, so uh, there's been a lot of rain at night and sort of high winds. Um, and there's been quite a few interesting catches around the country of uh, different species. Uh, one place is Sandwich Bay, which I spoke about last week, having the fourth UK record of a certain moth species. Well, they've done it again with uh, the 12th record this time for another species called Dusky Marble Brown. Um, so it seems that there's been quite a bit of immigration recently. And um, they've also had another moth called a pearly underwing. And we can see with, with the rain, uh, they've at least had some good catches. So. 523 of 85 species in one night, which is five off, I think, my total record for species in my garden, although they also count all the little micros they get. Um, and even in Gloucestershire, there's been quite a few good catches of the rain. This was done by someone else within the Gloucestershire moth group. As you can see, there's a uh, eight privet hawk moths, um, a similar number of elephant hawk moths, uh, and two lime hawk moths, which I don't haven't got in my garden this year, sadly. Um, their season will be finishing soon. Um, but as you can see, the moths do actually like the rain, which is quite interesting. Um, obviously, these were caught with Robinson traps, which are a little bit more weatherproof. Uh, my trap is only a heath, which is uh, can sort of get filled with water uh, in a particularly rainy night. Um, so uh, I haven't had too many new species of moths for the year, um, but here's a few. Uh, this is uh, a shark, which is a bit of a strange looking moth and a bit bigger than I remember, but I believe it's called a shark because it's got this unusual sort of uh, pattern around its head, which looks a bit like a dorsal fin. Um, there's another species called cam chamomile shark, which is a little bit different, but I think this is just the regular shark species. Um, another moth that was a bit of a surprise in my trap is a swallowtail and I've mentioned it before in previous sessions but usually they don't enter the trap. Um, this one managed to uh, get in and sort of uh, stay in an egg carton which is quite a nice surprise because they're really good looking moth um, close up. Um, I've also got a few species that unfortunately I wasn't able to photograph but I did get. Uh, Marble Busey being one of them. This is a very small micro, uh, sorry macro moth um, and quite a striking looking one. I uh, got it this morning and I, as I went to get my camera out, unfortunately, it managed to fly off, which is a bit of a shame because um, it's been a nice moth to get a photo of. Um, and a beautiful hook tip was another one that unfortunately flew off almost immediately um, upon inspecting the trap. But again, a new species for my garden. Um, and another sort of exciting finding in uh, in uh, Wiltshire this time, or I think, I think, yeah, I think Wiltshire. Uh, was this, which is uh, none other than a death's head hawk moth, which is a very rare immigrant from the continent um, and a very large hawk moth, uh, probably made famous by sort of being on the poster for Silence of the Lambs um, because of its sort of ominous looking skull mark on the thorax. Um, uh, this one was found just roosting in a barn, uh, whether it was released sort of from a captive collection or possibly um, from the continent is, is unclear. I mean, people are allowed to sort of raise them in the UK. But I, th I was thinking that if we were to get death's head hawk moth on the coast, it would probably be a bit 
early in the season for them. So perhaps this was from a captive collection. Uh, we're not sure how we can tell. Um, I also visited my local patch for the first time in a while and I saw plenty of the high summer butterflies that expected. So dark green fritillary is a species uh, that is very common up on the hill at the moment. Very fast. It's very hard to uh, get them on camera. Um, but luckily this was a stop on a thistle. This was actually from last year because this year they were just flying around too quickly for me to sort of take a picture of. Uh, large skippers are also very common. This one's on a pyramidal orchid, of which there are plenty up on uh, Cleve Hill. Uh, marble whites are in very good number as well. Another high summer butterfly. Um, also meadow browns. Uh, ringlet is another common one up on the hill. Um, not a little bit harder to photograph because they're it's hard to tell them from sort of meadow browns from a distance, but I managed to find this one resting on a blade of grass. Um, and a rather unusual orchid is also up on the hill. This is a musk orchid, which is possibly the rarest plant we get in the nature reserve. Um, very hard to find as there are these sort of tiny just spikes of small flowers, greenish flowers, but um, quite popular with orchid hunters to try and find in the local area. And um, there can be good sort of patches of them. Um, this was down on the Bill Smiley Reserve, uh, just on the slope, so it was quite hard to get to. Um, or Cypress Bugloss, I think this is, uh, was out. I thought this flower was quite amazing looking. Um, lots of sort of blue, tall flowers along the uh, reserve. And uh, this unusual looking brown rook, which um, is notorious amongst uh, bird watchers on Cleve Hill because it's been pr present for several years. Um, this is my first time I'd ever seen it. It almost felt like I'd sort of come across a mytholo mythological sort of legend within the um, <laughs> within the uh, birding community in Gloucestershire. Um, within my own garden, I also found this. Uh, so I'm not sure what these caterpillars are. I have to try and work them out. But this, I think, is a, a ladybird bird sort of larva um, in a in a pupa. It's, it's just about to develop into an adult. I uh, found several of these on the uh, on the leaves. Um, so I'll have to keep watching them. I think, unfortunately, they might be harlequins, uh, not the native species, but that's a nice thing to find. Um, both wise, I think the next two days are about going to be uh, really warm. So predicted to be 16 or 17 degrees at night. Uh, so it'll be interesting to catch and if whether I can get anything inter really interesting for the uh, final session next week. Um, fingers crossed. Um, certainly, I know other places in the country will be getting possibly some more migratory species. Um, I think the east is particularly <coughs> susceptible to have a warm southerly wind, which always gives a uh, good chance for some migrants. So we'll have to see. Um, but that's really what I've seen this week. Um, hopefully we'll be sort of seeing large blues and purple hair streaks over the next week as the weather's getting quite warm. Uh, so we'll have to see what I can get. <laughs> Thank, thank you, uh, Greg. Um, Steve has replied that that unknown larvae, the one next to the um, coccinella day, uh, is a sawfly larvae, or are sawfly uh, larvae. There were a number of them. And he also okay. mentioned that dark green fertilities turned up in brock holes. Brock holes is the uh, reserve that we were looking at in the webcam of the week. Uh, but the thing that caused the greatest stir amongst the comments, of course, is the death's head hawk moth. Um, and um, how sinister that is. And um, what a pleasure to see something like that, uh, having come across to, to visitors at this time. So we go back to our slides. Um, Steve's talking about the uh, the squeak uh, with the death of the hawk moss. Do you want to say something about that whilst I just get, take the, get the next slide sorted out, Steve? It's not so much a squeak as like a buzz. And uh, I'm told by a beekeeper friend of mine that it's a noise that the queen bee makes because the death head hawk moth actually you, raids beehives. It's got a very short proboscis and one of the things, it can't get in modern beehives, but in the old beehives it used to go in and then eat the honey. And so it's uh, it's thought that's why it has the skull marking as well, because it kind of mimics the head of a queen bee. God, a strange creature. <laughs> so presumably as bees become more commercialised, there's less food for the hawk moths? 
Well, yeah, I think the, th the thing is the modern hives, the holes aren't big enough for the bee to get in easily, whereas the old style hives, they could. Thank you. But it's, Thank you. Yeah. Um, we'll now pass on to our guest for the day, to Tim, but I'm going to ask Jamie to introduce uh, Tim to us all. Okay, thank you everyone. So Tim's a very good friend. Um, I met him when he was a PhD student. He's done many great things since then and has acquired a number of exotic beards, one of which you saw on the photo last week. Um, we shared a week on Sky in April 2018 and Tim was making beautiful landscape photos on the seashore and I was freezing my backside off in the sea. So he, he had an uplifting time and I was close to needing hospitalization. Um, he's going to talk to us today about how a basic natural history knowledge, both in Britain and further afield, is both great fun to acquire and incredibly useful for a wide range of careers in ecology and conservation, both in the UK and further afield. So thank you for your time, Tim, and go for it. Thank you very much, Jamie. Can everybody hear me okay? This is coming through all right, is it? Great stuff. Excellent. Right. Well, we'll crack on then. And so, uh, yeah, as Jamie... Let's just run that again. So uh, just sorry. imagine if it's just uh, handed over to you and everything's working okay. Just when I go quiet, just give me a couple of Thanks very much indeed, Jamie. It's great to be here and thank you very much for inviting me. As Jamie mentioned, I'm going to talk today just a little bit about a few of the things that I've done over the past few years. And in a way, we can treat this as a bit of a careers talk, particularly focused to those of you who might be at the early stages in your career and deciding what exciting things you want to go on and do. And really, how, what are those routes and how, how can uh, the things that you do now and the, the, th the, the processes that you set in motion right now can lead to, uh, to doing those exciting things or getting you to the place that you want to be in a few years time. Um, but first of all, so I should say that the emphasis very much will be on the natural history rather than the fame and fortune. Uh, but the first thing to mention is that it, this week is National Insect Week. I'm a, a, a trustee of the Royal Entomological Society and so I'm involved with all, all of that side of things. Um, and so there are loads and loads of events going on this week. Uh, of course, most of them virtual online events. Uh, brilliant things to do during lockdown and so a, a quick plug to head over to the National Insect Week website uh, and go and have a look and see what is what is going on and the things that you can join in with. One of the things is a photography competition. I'm uh, judging the photography competition because uh, I'm also interested in photography and so you might wonder uh, why am I starting this presentation with a photo of a bird. This is a Choco Toucan that I took um, I took this photo last summer in, in Ecuador in the, uh, the, the cloud forest on the, the western side of the Andes there in Ecuador um, but don't worry because if we zoom in on the photo you can see that it is actually a photo of an insect so there I think it's probably a bee flying next to the uh, to the Choco toucan so true to form uh, on the macro photography front there um, so really a quick potted history of, of the things that um, I mean I, I don't even really consider it a career I suppose at the minute but uh, the route that I took to get where I am today um, started off with a degree in zoology at, at the University of Leeds and then did a master's in biodiversity and conservation also at Leeds uh, and then that was followed on by a PhD in insect ecology tropical insect ecology at Cambridge where I was based in the Museum of Zoology which is uh, as Jamie mentioned where we met so this is me up a tree in Borneo uh, sampling insects from the rainforest canopy there um, and then after that went on to do another master's I was a glutton for punishment and so went on to do uh, another postgrad degree in science media production at Imperial College in London and so that really has led to me having a, a, a quite a diverse and mixed career so far but doing some quite exciting things that and some of the things that are the kind of things that undergrads often really want to get into so whether that's working out in the field in the tropics um, or working in tv and radio so uh, those things um, th those kind of academic introductions led me to, to doing things like this is uh, some of my research assistants in Papua New Guinea I was doing a project for Oxford on insect ecology there um, but then also doing things like recording bees in Madagascar for Radio 4 I uh, presented stuff with the uh, wonderful Alice Roberts on BBC4, a programme about spiders that we did a few years ago. Uh, and then nowadays I kind of act as a consultant for TV programmes. Uh, I'm a lecturer at Falmouth University. I teach on a uh, marine and natural history photography course. But now I act as a consultant and um, insect wrangler, an animal wrangler for mainly behind the scenes uh, with TV programmes and various other different productions. But these uh, the, doing these exciting things has led, led to... Um, 
some real career highlights like working with some of my natural history heroes um, that's Dave Lee who's here you can see on the right who's a great natural history director and the presenter of that program was quite good as well uh, sadly I probably don't have long enough to explain the story behind how, how I came to be lying at David Attenborough's feet on a beach in Borneo throwing frozen butterflies at him but uh, perhaps we could talk about that another time um, so so this uh, this kind of broad broad range of things it really, uh, although I, I've, I've got the, the kind of degrees and things like that, but really actually what is behind all of those things and the, the, the various uh, diverse projects that I've been involved with, really, I think we can put it all down to one thing. And that thing is natural history. And it's why I wanted to mention that uh, today and particularly now, there are so many statistics going around at the minute about the, the number of UK school children who, who can't identify stinging nettle or the number of uh, adults in the UK that can't identify our 10 commonest trees. And so really this, if anything, is a bit of a call to action to make sure that those of you right at the very beginning of your career see the importance of basic natural history. And these are things that are disappearing from courses in, in zoology and in biology, even in wildlife biology uh, and conservation. Things are uh, moving away from natural history. And somebody's made a comment, Fiona, there, that there is a, a movement that people are in consultation right at the very minute um, to create a GCSE in natural history. Uh, so let's be part of that movement to, uh, to hopefully turn the tide on those basic natural history skills. And so this thing, thing here, the giraffe necked weevil that I was filming um, just before Christmas in Madagascar for a, a big new online, online series. Um, Interestingly, actually, from the same subfamily of beetles as the uh, the hazel leaf roller that I showed earlier on. So we've got some exciting things in the UK, which I'll come to in just a second. But filming the giraffe neck weevil, for example, um, or recording animals in the rainforest in Madagascar. This is a, a peronet leaf-tailed chameleon in the, the Rana Mafana rainforest. Um, and, but also doing scientific projects like this one. This is the one I mentioned earlier for Oxford or the, the Natural History Museum um, expeditions and things like that that I've been involved in, with. Or even whether it's taking students on field trips to uh, Botswana and South Africa where I, I took this photo here. Every single thing of those, uh, really the skills involved in all of those things are basic natural history skills. Now, this really is where it all began. So this is the start of the path, in my opinion, for, for everybody um, that will hopefully lead you to doing these exciting things. So this was the, the Collins Gem Guide to Insects, the book that uh, I, I had in my suburban back garden in Hull, not a very um, a spectacular or exciting place really, but just armed with this tiny, tiny little book, I could spend hours just in a perfectly normal back garden. And every time I went out, I would find a new species of insect. And so, we at the moment we are in what i would consider a golden age of guidebooks so over the past few years for example there's uh, the the book on the top right there britain's spiders a field guide there hasn't really been a, a a decent guide a decent field guide to the spiders of the uk ever and one was published just a couple of years ago and so now we've got this plethora of ways to get involved and to uh, to get engaged with natural history that some of which genuinely haven't existed before in the, the few hundred years that we've been studying species right in the uk and so if anything i'd like to say to people um and it, it's so good to to hear uh, the results of the moth trapping and things like that that are going on and the the wildlife webcams but it's something that I've certainly noticed among students that many people don't have that group of animals or plants or other living things that they're really passionate about. So I would say the first step to a, a successful career in ecology or zoology, or even if you want to get, to get into TV, uh, the, the entertainment side of things or science communication, is to buy one of these books and just really learn the fauna and flora of your own back garden um, inside out. And so th there's the, a point about natural history. There's another point really and I don't want to um, be misleading by showing so many pictures of exotic locations because a, a, a piece of advice that I often give to students is go on an expedition in your back garden. Just like that basic book, The Collins Gem Guide to Insects, right in the UK we have some phenomenal things. Despite being one of the, the most depauperate countries in the world in terms of our, our flora and fauna, we've still got so many different things uh, to look at. And just uh, in, in my own group, insects, I don't think there is a person that exists who could reliably go and identify any species of insects that you find in the UK. We've got about 24,000 different species and nobody, nobody uh, exists who could pick any random insect um, and identify it down to species, particularly when you get into flies and parasitoid wasps. 
But there are so many things to see in the UK and so many uh, ways to, to flex those natural history muscles. So this is a, uh, a late spider orchid from the, the Downs in Kent, a slightly a very rare pale, pale version of this very rare species of flower. Um, but then even very common things, and of course this is uh, some bits of photography that I've done over the past few years, but really focusing on some, some quite common species. This is the, uh, the black honeybee, which is a subspecies um, of uh, Apis mellifera, the, the, the native honeybee. And this is the, the, the subspecies or strain of honeybee, which is native to the UK and has been found in the Viking settlements, for example, evidence of those. Um, or, but even some of our really common things, of course, we've got uh, amazing coastlines around the UK. And so things like this common prawn, if you treat them in the right way, really spectacular animals. Um, and on that subject of rock pooling, I think really uh, that some of the most biodiverse parts of the UK, but really we've got examples of every different type of organism in our rock pools in the UK that you could find in a tropical coral reef. Of course, coral reefs are, are, are slightly more diverse places, but in terms of the, the different types of different thing, we can find all of those just in our rock pools, just off the shore of the UK. Um, this is one of my favourites. This is a long-legged spider crab. It's about the size of a 50p across um, and it transplants this uh, particular species of seaweed all over its legs so that it's camouflaged um, in amongst those dangerous rock pools. Um, uh, moving on again with, uh, with rock pools, this is a worm pipefish, another, another relatively common species relative to the seahorses. Um, and what is possibly my favourite British animal, or one of my favourite British uh, animals, the blue ray limpet, uh, found down at the low tide mark. Uh, so find find those really low tides and go and uh, they sometimes become exposed on the uh, the holdfasts um, of kelp species. So go and have a poke around. Really spectacular thing, just on a slightly smaller scale than some of the larger tropical animals. And then, of course, we do have our cuddly things as well. So if you're interested in birds and mammals, um, that the UK is a great place uh, to be as well. Um, but also we have exotic species. So this is one that uh, a photo that I took just a, a few hundred metres away from here. This is an unarmoured stick insect from a colony that was introduced uh, to this part of the UK around Cornwall about 100 years ago. But the point really um, is that it, you don't need to go very far, although lots of people are excited about going to the tropics and going to rainforests, and rightly so, you don't need to go far to find some really exciting things uh, to look at. And for those of you of more of a scientific bent, this isn't all about the kind of soft side of natural history, about observations and recordings and uh, science communication and photography. Uh, and I'll, I'll finish on this point here. This is a photo of a, a thick-legged flower beetle, sometimes called a swollen um, swollen thigh flower beetle. Wow, thank you Fiona, that's very kind. Um, uh, swollen thigh flower beetle, sometimes known as the family Edemeridae. And these things, I took this photo last year, but they are flying around right now and they'll be around throughout the summer. And a relatively common species really expanded its range over the past 10 years. Now, this species was described about 250 years ago. So the first species description um, of this uh, all that time ago. And it wasn't until earlier on this year that somebody, uh, in fact, our old head of department, Jamie and my head of, uh, ex-head of department, Malcolm Burroughs from Cambridge, now retired, a typical retired academic who still uh, still pretty much works full time on, on his research. It wasn't until earlier on this year that that basic question about the natural history of this beetle, why does it have these very conspicuous chunky thighs? Um, it was answered earlier on by somebody doing some very basic work um, on a, a very, very common, common insect in the UK and in Europe. And so really, if there's a, a conclusion to all of this is, uh, I know that lots of us have uh, very specific things to, to study, whether you're learning about your statistical analyses or your uh, population dynamics and things like that. But don't forget the very basics of natural history about learning about how to identify species, how they all fit together um, and learning about the life histories of some of the exciting things that we can find right on our doorstep. And so there we go. I'll leave it there. Thanks very much for having me. And if anyone's got any questions, well, uh, I don't know if we've got time for questions now, but if not, please feel free to drop me a message on uh, Instagram or an email. I'm happy to, to have a chat about anything else. Thanks very much. Thank you, Tim. We do have time if there's anybody who wants to, um, to, to ask any questions or anything. I see that Almo is saying congratulations all the way from Italy. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, Glad and to thank hear. you, and so is Hugh. And, uh, I think we all agree with your comment about the importance of basic natural history and uh, acquiring those skills that allow one to interact with the natural world um, in, in a, a way that opens up so much 
um, one doesn't need a great deal of, of knowledge in order to do that, but one does need some knowledge. And as you alluded to, that is, uh, it is lacking, unfortunately, with many people at the moment. We're in the third generation of this disconnect uh, from uh, a, a good knowledge, a good working knowledge of natural history amongst the general population. And, and that is uh, uh, to be worried. I see Fiona, you, did you say there are 24,000 insect species in the UK? Yeah, as I understand it, of course, um, the UK has, of course, one of the best described uh, flora and faunas as, of, of anywhere in the world. And, and so we've, but even now, species are still being discovered in the UK. Yeah, but I think that's the rough number that we have for the, the number of species in the UK. And Steve, who is a fellow entomologist of yours, um, mentions that there are now many social media groups that allow access uh, to expertise and to knowledge. It really is a, a great thing, yes. I mean, the, it, it, I, I always get amused by it on some of these groups when um, uh, some people that I know from the Natural History Museum, for example, and people are arguing with the, the world expert on a particular family of insects about the idea of, uh, of something. Um, and, and I think these online tools are hugely, hugely important. There is another point about natural history, though, is that I do see it as a great way to have a, a digital detox, as it were. And so actually there's um, lots of my students uh, take the, the normal way for finding things out nowadays is to type a question into Google. Uh, and nine times out of 10 with natural history, particularly that will lead to an incorrect identification. And so I still think that we, although there are great apps around there and even things where you can play, uh, have your phone listen to a bird song um, and it will identify the species for you. I don't think that there is anything yet that is better than a good solid basic guidebook. Indeed. Uh, I think it is now time to move on. Thank you very much, Tim. Thank you. Um, we move on to our next item. Uh, and I'm going to invite Hugh to introduce his film. Um, this is a film we made, or well, I made in lockdown. Um, it was for university, but I thoroughly enjoyed making it. And um, it, it was a, it's a short story about the, my local birds that visit my garden. Although, sadly, the uh, star of the show hasn't been around since I made the film. She might have moved on, but um, yeah, I guess I'll, I'll let you watch it instead of uh, rambling on too much about it. Thank you very much, Hugh. In a world dominated by humans, our gardens are important resources for wildlife. One that allows us to observe a variety of wild animals right on our doorstep. This female blackbird visits this garden for a drink and a bath every day as part of her daily routine. Bathing helps make sure that her feathers are in good condition, keeping her agile in the air and can mean the difference between life and death if being chased by a hawk. But something's interrupted her bath. A male blackbird. She's not seen this male before and it seems to have caught her attention. Time for a closer look. Blackbirds tend to be solitary birds, but form pairs when it's time to mate, raising their young together. Perhaps she thinks this male would make a suitable partner. His entirely black feathers bright yellow bill and distinctive yellow eye ring are enough to attract any female blackbird. However, it seems she wasn't interested in finding a partner after all. She just didn't want to share her food. Does anybody would like to make any comments about Hugh's film? I'll just uh, apologise for the quality of the narration. I'm not a fan of my own voice, so. 
Uh, it, sure. it was absolutely fine, Hugh. Absolutely fine. And uh, Fiona says that it's a lovely bit of behaviour, a charming film, and Jamie that it's really good, which I uh, support those two comments as well. We will move on to the next speaker today, which is Ursula, uh, talking about words. Moderator, so you can do that. So if you could start again, Ursula, just give her a couple of seconds when I go quiet yeah. and start again, please. Thanks very much, Philip. Um, as we're so warm today, um, I thought I'd take us somewhere a bit cooler and a bit fresher. So we're going to go up to the island of Orkney and I'd like to share with you a few excerpts from a memoir called The Outrun by Amy Liptrot. Let me just move this on here. Um, this is perhaps an interesting piece of nature writing because it's one of the maybe newer generation or younger generation of nature writers. And we've been talking a lot today about how technology can enable our engagement with the natural world and enable our engagement with others. You know, the way that you can get to an expert so easily through social media and through the internet. Um, and what's interesting about Amy Liptrot's work is the way that she constantly uses technology um, as a way of trying to situate herself in the natural world to enhance her understanding of it and both to record and intensify her experiences that she has with nature. So this is a typical example where she's up somewhere very remote, very wild, and she's trying to understand her physical location. So she's cross-referencing the shoreline with the Ordnance Survey map in my pocket, Google Maps on my phone and my visual and physical experience. I am locating myself, putting the correct name to inlets and outcrops around the North Hill. The power of Keldy looks like a potential spot to swim at low tide. Mad Geo is dark and intense. For me, these places, the Sneck, Erival, exist both digitally and underfoot. So I think that the way she lives in, in the virtual space and the physical space is very interesting. And I think when she says that she's locating herself, I think there's a lot of meaning in that, that she's using these digital tools and devices as a way of creating personal meaning, as well as literally understanding where it is that she is physically finding herself. And again, she says very, very clearly, I am using technology to take myself to the centre of something from my spot at the edge of the ocean. I'm trying to make sense of my environment with my digital devices. The planes and birds and stars seem more quantifiable and trackable. I take a photograph of the setting sun over West Ray and upload it to Facebook. My sky is converted into zeros and ones. My personal data beamed to satellites, bounced through fibre optic cables under the sea, through microwaves and copper wire, over islands, to you. So there's a very personal connection made there between the writer and the reader. And along the way, we see that she is embracing the internet and really thinking about the internet as part of the world and integrated with our world. Um, and using it to enhance both her understanding but our communication around it. So I just thought that was particularly apt, especially given the Facebook activity that we've been very glad to note around um, our meetings and our conversations. So to move on from that, perhaps going back away from using electronic and digital tools, um, I'm going to take a bit of a risk here and share with you a very recent poem that I'm actually reading from my, this is my working notebook. And again, it's about locating oneself and locating oneself on the edge of the world. Um, in this case on Formby Beach. And you can see the photograph there is pretty much what I was looking at as I wrote this poem. And again, I still see that it's a kind of negotiation. It's trying to understand the self within the natural world, but also the man-made things that you can see the big ship on the horizon. You might be able to make out the uh, massive array of wind turbines that stretch right out to sea from where I was standing. So um, apologies if I stumble because sometimes I can't read my own handwriting, but here goes. There is a gap, 
a sky mirage where we know the river should be. Everything sparse and thin, open, empty, like there is more space than matter. Bands of light, lines of water, streaks of earth sparkle and flow. Crushed shells confetti the sand, a bottle half buried. Jellyfish spot the tide line, their glossy depths congealing, mattifying in this endless wind, clean and probing like medical fingers. Marum grass sighs, holds it all together, round the dead Christmas trees and the driftwood, a rusted can of tractor enamel, stray plastic, its purpose obscured. Sand martins dip and skim as a whelk's egg case, long abandoned, blows along to rest in dried seaweed. The channel glitters, seems too small and narrow for the bulk of a dredger, the remains of a wreck dark and awkward in the silver blinking. Behind slothful turbines, indolent despite the quickening wind, unreal before a holly blue headland, hilltops lost in cloud which sits beyond, the brightness and the worm casts, broken glass strobe lights the running dogs and children, subjects of the sun as it slides toward evening. So I'll leave you maybe with that reflective space. Maybe I've taken you to the beach in a cool breeze on this very warm afternoon. You certainly have, Ursula, the power of poetry. One of the powers of poetry is to create imagery in people's minds. And certainly for me, you created uh, an image of a landscape that I don't visit very often and that I haven't visited for quite some time. So thank you for taking me to that place and to sh for sharing your experiences there. We move on from one form of imagery, the imagery that's created by words, uh, onto an imagery that's created digitally nowadays, picking up again from something that Ursula mentioned, and it's over to Jamie. Welcome. Um, Ursula, I really enjoyed your poetry. Um, I've been on the on the Wirral shore quite a lot recently and it's a beautiful place. Um, so I tried very, very hard this week not to do another session on insect photography because you must be getting bored of them by now. Um, so I duct tape an old tripod head to a tree next to our bird feeder, which was exactly as ugly as it sounds. And I bolted the camera to it and I downloaded the free app that lets you run the camera remotely. And that works really well. And I waited for half a day for the usually very attractive small birds to perch on their small branch and wait for, um, which is where they queue and waited for the feeder. And the best photo I got is this. Um, so not, not, not a great success, it's the kind of the left hip of a magpie. So I had to find something else for you. Um, and I realized that the local RSPB reserves are starting to open again. Now, although the hides aren't open in any of them, as far as I know, um, 50 to 100 of England's reserves are open and a few in Northern Ireland. And I will post the link for the list of those into the chat at the end. Um, I've been there dozens of times before lockdown and love it very, very much. So it's really good to get out. Now there's no hides, so that's a real problem for long lens photography, um, but it's absolutely fine for the kind of compact photography, compact camera photography I'm trying to show you. So this is the gloomy, moody sky earlier in the week over Burton Mere. It's a beautiful place. Um, all the hides are closed, as you can see. I am. The the reserve is very, very bushy because none of the vegetation has been cut and I saw something moving down this path, but I couldn't investigate it. Um, now, as I've mentioned before, you, off, you get a lot of wasps on any bare wood um, hammering away at it to try and attract the, try and sorry, collect the um, what will become paper for their nests and I tried to photograph this and initially the results were appalling as you can see in image number four 
Uh, but after a lot of success, I kind of got somewhere. So as with all of these shots, this is on a cheap compact camera in macro mode. Now, one of the problems here is that although the um, the camera's not moving at all and it's stabilized, the WASP is really hammering its head up and down. So you need quite a fast shutter speed. So you need the WASP to be in the sun. If it's in the shade, you can't get any sharp pictures. I took a couple of hundred for this before I got a good one. Um, and nothing happened for the next half hour or so. So I was getting pretty desperate and took this very mediocre landscape shot, although it is a place I very much like. And back when the hide, when the hides are open again, there's a lovely hide far to the left, kind of about a mile's walk from the visitor center, which doesn't get that many people and has really, really good views over water. So well worth a look. Um, and there were a few warblers in the distance, but really nothing much to photograph. Um, but then I eventually started seeing some more insects. Um, I think this is a fly. Um, it's got these kind of ridiculous eyes. And as you can see, it's very, very small, um, maybe eight inches long. Sorry, eight millimeters long, um, something like that. And um, these huge, huge eyes. Um, so again, you can have an incredible amount of, of fun and get some really nice pictures. Um, if you persevere and in the end I was hanging out um, if you look in this picture I was hanging out to the left of here where the path rises and you look down and there weren't any birds at all but I ended up in a bramble and nettle patch and I had a really lovely time with the insects which I will show you um, this is a horsefly. Um, now, the camera, which as I said is very cheap, has a habit of resetting itself. I've just seen Fiona's comment in the about lots of shots in the comments. It resets itself to one shot at a time whenever you switch mode. And I'd forgotten this. So this is a horsefly, and I only got two shots of this, whereas I would have wanted 20 or 30 to get the right positions of focus, but by sheer dumb luck, I got one that was focused on the eyes and one that was focused on the front of the thorax. And I could chuck these two images into Photoshop Elements and merge it. So really, really lucky. Um, a long time later, I was concentrating on some ruby-tailed wasps, which you'll see later on. And I'm pretty sure one of these bit me in the neck. Um, it certainly hurt. So um, that's concentration for you. But I was rather carried away by the wasps which we'll see in a bit. Okay, now a scorpion fly, never photographed one of these before. It was a huge patch of mixed nettle and bramble and just a huge amount of life there. Butterflies, loads and loads of different hymenoptera, loads of flies, it, it was really, really good. Next we have what I think is a beetle, but I've never seen one before. And I think it's laying an egg, um, either that or it's defecating. But this is a grass stem and you can see the bottom of the nettle at the top of the frame. So lovely, lovely life. And just spending some time in the sun poking around with this little camera. It's good fun. Um, thank you, Steve, for your comment. Um, and then I'm leaving the best to last. But this was a gorgeous deep blue fly. I really, really like the color of this. As you can see, this is a lot darker than the background, which is a piece of wood. And so it's very important to try and get the exposure right in camera. That matters less with more expensive gear, but this is a small sensor. So you really don't want to have to boost the darks too much. So I would have overexposed this to lighten that deep, deep blue and then a little bit of tweaking afterwards. And the eyes aren't quite in focus, but I just love that color. And finally, I wasn't going to talk about this when Philip asked us about what we'd seen that was new, but I saw my first ruby-tailed wasps yesterday. And this is one hanging out in a groove on a fence next to some kind of stripy fly. And they, and then a couple of close-ups, and they're just amazing. There's, there were three of these at the site. They were very, very tame. They're about something like 12 millimeters long and their lifestyle is to move into the nests of solitary bees and wasps and to lay eggs in them but these are defenseless in the sense that they don't have a sting 
but they're incredibly strongly armored and once they curl up into a ball there's nothing that the host hymenoptera can do about it they can't penetrate that ball with their stings so eventually they just have to get rid of it because it's in the way and so they dump the wasp somewhere else and the wasp rests uncurls and then goes back into the nest so it's a wonderful wonderful example of, of a parasitoid wasp and they're absolutely beautiful and this is a close-up again taken on a very affordable camera and you can see that the the body texture and the armor is just really remarkable um, ironically because this is iridescent not only just the front half of the animal color with the angle the back half changes as well so it doesn't look red it doesn't look ruby colored in this picture um, it's interesting to comment that the acelli which are those three organs on the top of the head look very big proportionally in this small insect so it may well be that there is a lower limit below which you cannot get functional acelli so the acelli look very small on large insects and very large on 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 small insects these are primitive um primitive high fast response light detection organs for measuring the angle of the horizontal which is very useful for flight okay i've prattled on quite a lot now so i will hand back to philip and as always you can ask me any questions on the facebook page thanks for listening thank you very much indeed for some wonderful imagery there and uh, this last image that you've left us with uh, i think is is particularly striking in that gradation of color that you can see and the, the detail that you can see of this particular insect uh, also interesting that um, social media is working that you put out a, a a species you're not sure what it is and there's immediately two people that come up with um, identifications for you which is which is great uh, we move on to um, things that we might have missed. Rob, are you able to take over now for a few minutes? Yes, certainly. So the news story that caught my eye, and this catches my eye because of my family background. Some of you might know I'm from a Scottish Irish fishing family and brought up with tales of what the fishing was like in the UK um, back before we had commercial fishing was this story about many wildlife trusts wishing to create highly protected marine areas. So the idea is that around the UK in very important sites, these areas would ban any kind of exploitation, even angling. And the idea being that these areas would be allowed to recover 100% and would be able to go back to, you know, the kind of way the environment was before we had this kind of industrial scale of exploitation. So I thought that's a really good move, something that's you know really needed in the country at the moment. We need to think about our marine habitats as well as our other habitats. And then moving on, talking as we have done quite a bit about apps and things like that and social media. So the app this week that I've been looking at is this one called iNaturalist, which like many apps helps you to identify plants and animals, but this one also has a social media content. So you can join discussion groups in areas that you're interested in, whether that's UK wildlife or Madagascan plants. And in those discussion groups, as already has been mentioned today, often there are specialists, scientists, who are members of that discussion group. So you can get quick access to expert advice and information that way. And also there's opportunity to take part um, in citizen science um, projects. So I thought that's a really nice app that's pulling together, not just identification, but the citizen science thing. And knowing today how young people are very addicted to their, we're not gonna get the phones out of their hands, but at least we can make sure or we can try and make sure that there is some good content that would help them, you know, with the career of being a naturalist. And the final, the resource I've been using this week actually goes to something that Greg said I was very interested in, that he nearly stood on an adder, because I've never seen an adder in the UK. And there's a source called Record Pool, where people put in their observations of wildlife. And if you go to this particular website, you can actually 
um, search on interactive maps for where there are records of different animals. So I'm very keen to see an adder. I've never seen one. So I've been going through um, the interactive maps, looking at where the best places are for sightings of adders, most recent sightings and things like that. So I've been trying to use technology to um, aid my kind of, you know, quest to see certain animals and things like that. And I think I'll stop there. Thank you very much indeed, Rob. And as usual, uh, an interesting and eclectic mix of things that you might not otherwise have been aware of. And I wonder um, if anybody has got any further thoughts on this. Uh, as one person thought it people thought that it was a tufted duck. And in fact, those two people were correct. It's a tufted duck um, diving, as we can see. So congratulations to those people that identified that correctly. Next week, our guest will be Rob Popple. Uh, would you like to say something about our guest next week, Jamie? Um, yes, so Rob um, is an ecological consultant um, who works for a rate, uh, primarily for the EU in kind of works from his home um, in designing conservation policy. But as he's also a passionate bird photographer um, and, and bird biologist, so he may well talk about some some ringing schemes he's been doing for the BTO. Excellent. Well, I look forward to that. And our uh, um, programs are available on Facebook for. Uh, for anybody to watch, those that you've perhaps uh, is recorded of our programmes available on Facebook uh, for anybody to watch at any time that they wish. And I would now like to thank our contributors for today, to Greg, to Ursula, to Jamie and to Rob, and in particular to Tim, our guest, and thanks to Jamie for pulling this week's episode together.